Hello everyone, Pahamar here with episode 5 of Let's Mod Reboot. In today's episode, we are going to be going over proxies, reference, and utility classes. A couple house cleaning items I'd like to go over first. Uh, in previous episodes, I have been recording on my desktop in 1080p with it being downscaled to 720p. My hope was that it would show up uh, nicely on YouTube for people to be able to view without having to be full screen. Um, downside is, is that the downscaling actually made all the text completely garbled so it was really hard to read anything. From now on I'm going to be recording in 1080p and I'm not going to downscale. And you probably noticed I've increased the font size of my IDE so hopefully it's a lot easier to read. Secondly, I would like to answer, um, people have been commenting on the noise gate on my uh, microphone. I run a noise gate uh, specifically because I have dogs and they are noisy and they like to chew on things and they like to sit right underneath me while I'm recording and chew on things and it gets to be a lot of background noise. So the noise gate helps uh, make sure that when I'm actually not talking you don't just get to listen to a bone being chewed on. So I apologize for people who don't like that. Um, my hope is that in doing this, at least, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, um, you not everyone has to listen to my dogs at the same time, so um, there's that. In the previous episode, we went over um, the resource and asset locations where things should be placed, uh, and so in today's episode, we're going to um, start looking at uh, some nice utility uh, methods, as well as this idea of a proxy. So a proxy in Minecraft is used specifically to help um, deal with the fact that Minecraft is sided. So what does sided mean? Minecraft being sided means that there's both a client and a server side. Uh, the server side does the majority of the thinking, the computation, the work and everything. And the client acts more as a presentation layer. By presentation layer I mean the, the client figures out if someone places, sorry, the server knows if someone placed a block. The server tells the client, hey, someone placed a block. The client renders the block. Not all the same code exists on the server as the client. Uh, it's mostly the case that it is. However, um, a server doesn't need to know how to render uh, images on a screen. So there's a lot of client-sided stuff um, that doesn't exist in the server code base. Um, sided allows us to kind of keep those unique things unique and keep the common things common. So Forge Mod Loader has this proxy concept, and this proxy allows your mod to deal with the proxy object and reference it in a common way, but understand that Forge Mod Loader will actually run the uh, specific thing that's needed on that space, and you get to define that. So it's kind of vague right now. Uh, I think it'll make a little bit more sense here if we actually go through an example. So. I'm inside of the mod class here, and actually before I even add this object, I should define it. So I'm going to add a new package, I'm going to call it proxy, so that I can keep all my proxy related stuff inside of this package. I'm actually going to add four things into this package. I'm going to add an interface, which will define all the methods that the proxy classes need to implement. I'm going to define a common proxy, a client, and a server one. So I will get to doing that here. So the interface, it's kind of good practice to uh, whatever interfaces you make to, uh, to start them with I to indicate that they're an interface. So we have iProxy. And then I'm going to add a common proxy. And I'm going to make that implement iProxy. And I'm going to add a client proxy. And I'm going to add a server proxy. So why did I do, um, let's just make sure I add that to git. Uh, for people who are wondering, if you see something uh, kind of maroonish orange here, it means that um, IntelliJ is telling you that it hasn't been added to any git related work is not being version controlled so you can actually the keyboard shortcut to, to put it in version control is control alt a so why did I set it up like this uh, and we're actually not complete and I'll explain that in a second so 
the interface is empty right now, but in here is where we will define what methods uh, classes that implement this interface must uh, implement. This is uh, just a kind of a nice way to say, okay, I'm going to define this proxy method here, and this way I can ensure that I've done it properly on both sides, because it'll warn you, hey, you haven't implemented this, this is an error, you have to implement this method. Common proxy implements this uh, for the simple fact that actually client proxy and server proxy are going to extend common proxy. And hopefully I don't mix this up. Um, client proxy and common proxy are actually fairly easy to mix up in speech. So, In Java inheritance, when a child class uh, extends its parent, it has access to all the methods inside of the parent class as well as it can define its own. It can also override methods in the parent class. So we're doing it this way and leveraging inheritance uh, because we will have some methods that will act the same on both client and server that we need to keep inside of a proxy. We will have some methods that are only necessary for the client and so if we have them defined here the client will just override them if I, and similarly with the server proxy. So I'm actually going to make sure that my client proxy extends common proxy and that my server proxy extends common proxy. So we're almost there. So now we have an interface. We have a common class that implements that interface. And then we have two child classes that extend the common class. The last thing I like to do, and this is my method of doing proxies. This is not the be all and end all. Um, you can use just a simple common proxy. You can do this idea of a sided proxy. That's what we're getting at here. You'll see in a second when we get actually get to setting up the proxy inside of our mod class here. We are doing a sided proxy. Um, this is how I like to set it up. It's very st well structured and it kind of catches me from forgetting things. The last thing we're going to do is I'm going to make the common proxy abstract. What that means, uh, for those who aren't familiar, the common proxy has to implement all the methods listed in iProxy. There are no methods in here, but let's just imagine there's like six in here. Common proxy must implement them all unless I say it's an abstract class. Saying it's an abstract class means it's okay if it doesn't implement one of these methods. A child class that extends this will handle it. Roughly, I'm generalizing. So what this allows us to do is that I can say, put a method in here, so, public abstract void do client thing. So I've defined some random method in this interface. Common proxy, you can see, doesn't throw an error because it's an abstract class. But if I were to come to client proxy or server proxy, you can see an error message must either be declared abstract or implement abstract method do client thing in iProxy. So this is why I do it this way. This class doesn't get an error, but I'm warned on the client and the server side, hey, you have to do something with this class because it's defined here. You don't need a proxy right off the bat. Um, places where it will be useful are dealing with um, GUIs, um, dealing with um, any kind of texture related, like registering textures and tile entities and stuff like that. Um, so for right now, this is going to be empty. Um, we will add to this in the future. So it's just kind of a good thing to understand here. So we have the structure laid out. You can see, because I took away that method, client and server no longer have errors. But we've defined the classes, so now we can actually define the proxy element inside the mod class. So to do that, we actually have to do a sided proxy annotation for this guy. Public static, if I could type, I proxy proxy. And sided proxy does take some parameters. I'll just do it like this. Okay. Sided proxy, if you look at the definition for it, actually can take three parameters. The client side uh, parameter, the server side parameter, and the mod ID. Client side and server side, these are actually the fully qualified names, the class names for the proxy classes themselves. 
Also, side proxy allows you to specify a mod ID for this proxy. So if you were to have um, a mod that consists of multiple child mods, you would have multiple child proxies, and you would actually say, okay, here's the mod ID for this, uh, that this proxy applies to, here's the mod ID for that one. That's pretty advanced. We're not going to get into those kinds of situations uh, in this course. We're just going to do a single proxy for our single mod. So, like I said, client side and server side take the fully qualified class name for the proxy. A fully qualified uh, class name can be found by the chain here. So, com pahamar let's mod reboot client proxy. So you can see, com pahamar let's mod reboot. Oop, that's actually a good catch. Proxy dot client proxy. So this is the package name that we're this guy is in com pahamar let's mod reboot proxy. And then you just add the class name at the end of it. So that's how we get that. And similarly, we'll do it here. Yep, server proxy. Okay. So in doing this, we, what we told Forge Mod Loader um, is that this object right here is the proxy object, the side of proxy object. The client side version of this is defined by this class, and the server side version of this is defined by the server, uh, this class. Uh, we define it as an iProxy object because, through inheritance, because common proxy implements this, and sorry, common proxy implements iProxy, and client proxy and server proxy extend common proxy, they are also of type iProxy through inheritance. Hopefully you followed that. The short of it is, this is how you work, make it work. So we've defined ourselves a basic proxy object, which we will be leveraging later in the course when it comes to the sided things that we need to do in Minecraft. Now we should look at both the idea of reference classes and utility classes. Uh, these are not a standard that you have to follow at all. I don't even think they are a defined standard. Um, or if there are, there are multiple uh, definitions for how to best do this. This is how I like to do it because I find it makes it easy to know whether I, it's a class that's just holding helpful constants for me to reference, or if it's a class that has helpful methods in it for me to use. So utility methods. I like having them this way because then it's very easy to uh, when I'm debugging code or looking through things uh, to see what I'm using as a constant because it's separated out from other classes uh, as well as I'm able to look at individual utility classes for specific jobs. So um, because they kind of fall into two buckets I like to put them into two different packages. So we're going to go back to Let's Mod Reboot here. We're going to add a new package called Reference. And we are also going to add another method call uh, another package called utility. So these two packages are where we will contain those generalized um, reference and utility classes. Uh, why don't we start with reference first? Because this is a, a very simple concept to follow. So we'll add our first one, and this is just going to be a generic one called reference because we're just going to hold mod specific uh, constants in this one. Once again, this is a practice I like to follow. I recommend it. You don't have to follow it. Uh, from this point on in the video, it's pretty much just this is how I like to do things. You don't have to do it this way. Uh, the proxy, if you did want to do or you found you had to do a proxy, that's how you uh, have to define it here. Um, how I do it here is once again personal choice, uh, personal recommendation. So, disclaimer out of the way. We're going to add a reference class to our reference package. And quite simply, inside of here, we are just going to have a uh, common um, constants uh, for our mod. Uh, I like to do it this way because then I can just, uh, when I'm making a new mod, kind of copy this structure, this framework over, and I just have to replace the values in it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to show you what one looks like for Equivalent Exchange 3. So I'm just going to bring this other IntelliJ uh, window open. So here you can see, uh, we'll close proxy, you can see this reference package and this utility package. So in this reference class, right here, in the reference package, you can see that I have these 
uh, public static final strings that define my mod ID, my mod name, uh, my mod's fingerprint, the version, as well as the server and client proxy. So you can see it's very similar to what we've been doing so far. These are actually used. Oh, I don't know why it said that. These are actually used inside of Equivalent Exchange 3's class file. The, uh, the not class file, the mod file. So you can see here, and let me do this side by side. So we'll do this, and we'll do this. So you can see here, in the mod declaration for this class, I'm actually referencing a variable, as opposed to a hard-coded string. I'm just going to do that because it's actually a lot easier this way to, uh, to make new mods based off of this framework. Um, as well as if I were to want to change something, because I actually use this, you can see here, in a couple different places. Uh, and you can see uh, that I actually use a lot of these variables in many places across the mod. So it's a lot easier if I need to change it. I just change it in this one place and it goes out to all the places it's references. Uh, so if I were actually look at mod ID and look at the usages, you can see it's used in quite a lot of places. Uh, 10, uses, 10 usages total for mod ID. Uh, for mod name, there's three total. So we will be doing something very similar to that inside of our reference class here. So with that explanation out of the way, we'll come back to reference. And we will add a public static final, which is basically saying this is a constant, uh, mod, nope, sorry, string mod ID equals, and I'm just going to do this. So we're going to copy the mod ID from here. So here we go. We have our first constants inside of, constant inside of our reference class called mod ID. And it's the same value as what we have in the mod class that we defined earlier. So now I can actually do this. I can actually come back to the mod annotation in our mod class. And now I can say the value of this is actually reference.modID. So now if I ever change my mod ID in this, uh, uh, this mod, say for example I go from let's mod reboot 1 to let's mod reboot 2, I just have to change the value here and anywhere it's referenced gets updated. So. Uh, you can imagine we're also going to do public static final string mod name. And we will copy the value for name here. And public static final string version. So these are just strings. And I can actually come over here now and say reference.modName and reference.version. So you can see here, this is mod ID here, I can actually copy this here and use it here. So now I can make sure that my uh, mod instance mod ID matches up with my mod mod ID. Well, those are not easy things to say and keep straight in a sentence. So that's a very basic example of a uh, reference class. Uh, other ones that I find useful, and just to bring back, there's the dogs, just to bring back the equivalent exchange three example here. I apparently do not have my project window open. Okay. Um, other examples of ones you may have are, um, oh, here we go, got it working. So I have a reference class that holds uh, colors in it. I have one in here that holds my GUI IDs, um, any string paths to models, uh, as well as sounds or uh, paths to specific um, model specific textures or GUIs or whatnot. So those are good examples of things that could be wrapped up in a reference class rather than having values hard coded in your code. It makes it a lot easier to, de uh, to debug things. Now I did also talk about that we would have um, utility classes. So a utility class would be a class that's simply just um, 
Java class that holds a whole bunch of helper methods in it. So things that you do all over the place in other classes that you don't want to define multiple times. So for example, um, you can set the color value on item stacks in a co color overlay. Uh, so um, I showed you briefly uh, that, that I have a class in Quizlet Exchange 3 called colors and it contains, actually, you know what, I'll just show it to you again. It contains uh, hex code values for uh, different colors. So um, these break down to like this is a gray, this is pure white, uh, this is a bit of a red, a blue. These are just hex code strings representing a color. I have a utility method here called color helper that actually will get the color value from an item stack or check if an item stack has a unique color to it. So this class here will return the value that I might find in here. Not specifically, that's just a bad example because these are returning ints and these are strings. Let's see if I can find a better example here. Um, something we're actually going to touch on uh, in a couple episodes, the idea of logging. This is my number one utility class I use all the time. This is my log helper class. This class allows me to uh, very easily put log statements into the mod to help me trace things. Um, as of Minecraft 1.7, uh, Minecraft is using Log4j2 as its underlying logging framework. To a lot of you, that's probably not going to mean anything. For some of you who are familiar with different logging frameworks, that'll help um, probably tell you how things work. So what this utility class does is it has a single method in here called log that takes in a le uh, the log level and what you want to write. Then there's all these other ones here that actually are the specific logging levels. So uh, in the log4j and log4j2 family of loggers. Uh, and this is just a brief explanation as to why it's set up this way and how it could be used. Because utility classes are really uh, usage specific. So log4j and log4j2 are logging frameworks that allow you to log things at different levels. And it, they do it in levels because that way you can ignore things below a certain level and only pay attention to things above a certain level. It also allows you to kind of um, stamp what kind of a message it is. So you can say that uh, a message is just a debug message or it's an error message. Or maybe I should just warn someone about this. Or maybe it's just an information statement. Um, if you look in your Minecraft logs when you're loading up Minecraft, you'll probably see um, different levels of this. So this utility class here is simply something that allows me to type, and this will error, but I'll show you. When I want to write something, I can actually just do this. Anywhere in my code. Let's throw an error in here because it's not properly in a method or anything. But what it allows me to do is it allows me to say, hey, log helper, I want you to write this message as an info statement. And it does it. It's kind of hard to really show you a good generic utility class. Um, examples of other ones might be uh, ones that help you find um, different textures, different resources you're using, or sounds, or whatnot. Um, this is my number one one, and we'll go over this again in the logging lesson, um, which will give you a little bit more detail and examples of it. But uh, just trust me, you're going to want uh, utility classes in here. Um, there's not one that we're going to need right at this moment, but we will be populating these as we go through the class, uh, the course. So a little bit rambly this episode, because once again, we're still just very much building up the framework for this mod. Uh, it's very important to build up a framework, because once you get that done, you can actually get into... Um, uh, you can quickly start spawning off things like items and blocks and stuff, knowing that you've already taken care of a lot of the underground, um, a lot of the piping, so to speak. So let's recap this rambly episode. So we've touched on proxies and the idea of what the different sides of Minecraft are. We touched on the idea of a reference class. Uh, and its value in allowing us a single place uh, to go and change values uh, and have our code just automatically updated because our code references these constants rather than having them hard-coded everywhere. So I don't need to worry about and when I update my version number. I don't have to go to 10 different classes that have them, my version number in it. I just change it here 
and everything else, as long as it's referencing this constant, gets updated. As well as the idea of utility classes. We don't have an example in the mod right now, um, but you can look at Equivalent Exchange 3, and there's a bunch of other mods that kind of follow this model um, in terms of utility classes being a place where you will put methods that you commonly reference throughout your code that do things for you, rather than having them defined uh, multiple times. You can define them once and just reference them inside of its utility class. So I think that pretty much covers us for episode five. Episode six, we are going to, uh, the next episode, we're gonna start looking at how to do, um, how to set and load in configurations for your mod using uh, micro, uh, Microsoft. Minecraft Forge's configuration system. Uh, and then in the next episode after that, we're going to look into logging. And then in the two episodes after that, so episode six will be configuration, seven will be logging. Episodes eight and nine, respectively, we'll cover items and blocks. So just three episodes from now, actually I should say two episodes from now, in the third one after this, we will actually make our first items, and you'll start to see how this all kind of coalesces into uh, into a mod. So, once again, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. If you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach me on Twitter or IRC. Uh, if you do have a problem, it is very important that you have a crash log. Um, crash logs we will learn as we actually get to writing things and everything, uh, are the number one way to actually identify what's gone wrong, and it generally will suggest to you how to fix it. So uh, if you need support, um, comments in YouTube and whatnot, please put a link to the crash log you have, as well as please attach source code. That definitely helps uh, in debugging as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, I hope you guys followed, and uh, we'll pick this up in episode six. Um, thank you guys again. Uh, take it easy.